Hi everyone, my name is JP Manglinden. I am senior correspondent with Yahoo Finance where I write about the intersection of tech and business for the outlet 75 million uh, plus monthly readers. And I am super delighted today to moderate um, a discussion amongst some very uh, top level figures. Um, the, the theme of the panel will be very much around innovation um, and growth managing and sustaining that growth. And joining us for that conversation will be Adam Kostial, head of European listings at NASDAQ. Adam, come on up. There you are. And we'll just sit. Uh, Vinay Solanki, head of commercial growth funds at Channel 4. Vinay, come on up, please. Where do you want me, here? Uh, yeah, there's great. Perfect. I brought her to Time Inc. Did you? Stephen Haft, VP of innovation at Time Inc. And finally, Adrian Blair, COO of Just Eat. Maybe I'll come over here. The soap is huge. I don't know whether to sprawl. Um, guys, thank you so much for, for joining us on stage this afternoon. Very much appreciate it. Um, again, the idea is, you know, the panel is around innovation. Um, I'd love for you, I mean, some of us, I certainly know what your roles are and the companies you work at, but there may be some people in the audience who might not. So I want to give each and every one of you 60, min 60 seconds to two minutes um, to briefly discuss your roles at the companies and what you do. Um, Adam, maybe you want to go first. Yeah, so uh, Adam Kostas, I head up our listing business here in, uh, in Europe, or EMEA, and uh, so helping companies come to the exchange, and really we're focusing more and more on innovative companies taking part of the public markets. Uh, so that's a key part of our business. The other aspect is uh, I used to run our technology business for, for NASDAQ, and actually the old OMX, which was the Nordic exchanges. So 2008, NASDAQ bought the Nordic exchanges, and OMX was then the first electronic exchange for derivatives. And I'll talk a bit about that, how we now are today the leading provider of technology to 90 exchanges globally. So it's a key part of our business. Great. Stephen, yourself? I'm, I'm Senior Vice President at Time, Inc. We are the largest publisher in the United States. You know our brands, not just Time Magazine, but People Magazine and Sports Illustrated and Entertainment Weekly and Fortune, Fortune. 500, for example, where you worked for yes. five, five, six years, right? Exactly. And um, so <clears throat> we are the largest publisher in the US. I think we're the largest magazine publisher, formerly known as IPC in Britain as well. Uh, what is innovation? We are a 92-year-old company, uh, a 92-year-old culture of success. The folks who run the print side of our business uh, managed to take that print business and make it the most successful one in the US. So the culture of innovation is telling people who've done something really smart and really well that we have to change the game going forward and it's our consumers that are telling us we have to do it. Fair, fair. Vinay, I'd love to hear from you. Okay, so Channel 4 is a UK broadcaster. It's owned by the government, it's 100% ad funded, so no one pays a license fee, so it's different to the BBC. It has a unique programming strategy, which is around diversity and being a different voice in the market, which means it doesn't focus on getting big shiny floor shows like five, 10 million of ratings. Um, they focus on smaller shows. It delivers a really high quality audience, ABC One audience. It generates about a billion in revenue. I run an innovation activity where we uh, invest uh, so it's 100% ad funded, so people spend one to two million pounds or five million pounds on advertising. We give access to early, earlier stage companies, growth phase companies, a digital consumer who might be predisposed to spending all of their marketing spend on Google and Facebook, which is a pain point for us. So we say, here we go, it's two million, one million, three million of advertising, and we take passive equity stakes in those companies, generally e-commerce and marketplaces. Right. He tried to get a passive equity state in Google and Facebook, didn't get it, so... <laughs> <laughs> Adrian? Yeah, so I'm Adrian Blair, the Chief Operating Officer of Just Eat. Um, I hope many of you are our customers. Uh, perhaps hands up if you're a Just Eat customer. Good, good, excellent. I think maybe around half the hands in the room. 
um, uh, if we got to that share of the British population, then, then we'd, uh, we'd have an even bigger business than we do today. Um, so I'm the Chief Operating Officer. I've been with Just Eat for just, uh, um, just under six years now since uh, we were a startup. Um, we're now um, one of the fastest growing businesses in the FTSE 250. Um, and I'm responsible for our commercial operations around the world. So we have teams in, uh, in 13 markets around the world. And my job essentially is to make sure that we've got great teams who are performing well in all those markets um, and delivering our revenue and uh, profit numbers um, to our investors. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, this question is for any and all of you. And it's, it's such a broad question. It's around the idea of innovation itself. Um, you each hold very unique um, roles and thus unique perspectives. So what, what does innovation look like for each of you, and how do you enable it in your roles? Um, Stephen, I feel like we have this immediate rapport already because, as you mentioned, I worked at Fortune magazine for five years, and Time, Inc. is the largest app magazine publisher in the world. Correct? So how, you know, um, how do you take a company that was traditionally known um, for a for great print products, and then encourage innovation on the digital side? Well, uh, uh, innovation, which is just a matter of making a strategy and taking slightly bigger risks, um, that uh, one of the things you have to figure out in the process of strategy, which is the oldest science getting you from A to B, is what your problem is. Once you figure out what the problem is, uh, it, it's, it's not as easy as saying, oh, I know what the future looks like, it's B, how do we get there? First you have to understand what's going on in your own company. So the first thing we had to figure out is what was keeping us from getting where we thought we needed to go, which is toward growing the digital side of the business, relating to both a new customer and our current customer on different platforms. And at first, we thought the difference was print versus digital. Right. And it wasn't. And you, you were probably at the company at that time. It, um, because somebody I, I knew who worked at a newspaper company had a much easier time doing the transition from print to digital than we did. And he said, well, why is that different? And the answer was, because we turn out weekly, monthly, and long form product. And there is no such thing as weekly and digital, monthly and digital, and long form and digital. So the first thing we had to do was change. So what I felt we needed to do then, once, I, once we put that together, was to change the metabolism of the company more than the product of the company and make time into real time. So that became the goal, and that became my North Star. Can you, uh, as a brief follow-up, we, we talk about changing the metabolism of the company. Can you clarify what you mean by that? Um, for instance, there have been um, some, some tweaks to the structure, right, of um, some of the, the magazines to make them more efficient and, and, and create better content. Well, uh, the, the, the biggest change that, that we're in the process of making is until seven months ago, 100% of everything we published was written by a full-time employee. I remember going to a luncheon once where Jimmy Wales spoke, uh, the founder of Wikipedia, Jimmy Wales said, today is a very significant day in the life of Wikipedia. Today, we got our 750 millionth user and hired our 50th employee. Now, by comparison, as I say, we have 1,500 people in the company who are turning out every drop of content, including the digital. So one of the first things we had to do is start testing our appetite for contributor networks and having other people's work appearing under our ex these exalted brands. I mean, Time Inc. helps, did for a generation, help define what were important issues and how they might be thought about for a great many people globally. Mm -hmm. So uh, giving up that responsibility to third parties was a cultural issue we had to get through. But that would be an example is adding contributors to an other, what was a closed system. Got it, thank you. Adam, I'd love to hear from, you know, your perspective on, on, on innovation and how you sort of you know, enable it on your side. So essentially, Nasdaq sees itself as a technology company running different platforms, different services to different customers. So 
at the core, we see technology as our key asset. And you know, it, old technology is never competitive. So we really have to always look at innovating from day one and always making ourselves the most efficient platform with the most available content and the best possible reach. And at the end of the day, as an exchange, we have to be the most reliable provider because ultimately our brand stands for liability. So you have to sort of mix the fact of continuity with innovation in a balanced way. So at the end of the day, as I mentioned, you know, the orig origin of NASDAQ was the first electronic exchange for equities. OMX was the first Nordic exchange or first global exchange electronic trading on derivatives. And that has always been at the core when we merged those two companies in 2008, creating you know, what is now the largest exchange on a global basis with roughly 20,000 customers using technology in different ways. Everything from IR tools to a trading platform to a company wanting to list with us essentially is based on our core technology. And we need to make sure that ground platform is innovative as possible to make sure that it's as attractive as possible. Can you give like a brief example? Yeah, so basically the way we see it is that at that core, it has to be ultimately as efficient and as uh, reliable as possible. But we at a marginal cost have to be able to launch new marketplaces at a very quick time to market. So we just launched a complete new commodity exchange that took roughly five to six months in-house development in terms of making that launch. There's a lot of regulatory aspects and so on, but basically we can scale from that core in a very innovative way. So that's one example how we always look at how can we address different market types, quick time to market in a very efficient way. The other aspect is if you look at our core technology from a trading perspective and clearing perspective, providing technology not only for our own exchanges, but for other exchanges globally, Blockchain for us is the future. So we're looking at blockchain and looking at different prototypes. Where can we implement blockchain in the most efficient way? Where will it have the most impact? Without impacting the core where we are today, but clearly positioning us in a very efficient way for the future. And that's not only for us ourselves, but as we are a technology provider, we're looking to see if we use this technology, how can we sell it to other providers as well? You mentioned blockchain um, and yeah. taking a look at um, how and where can it be implemented? How and where can it be implemented? So we're, we're an exchange. Uh, so from our perspective, we are, we're doing different prototypes, everything from proxy voting to uh, doing credit, uh, credit uh, payments, mm -hmm. uh, almost like uh, you have payments for, uh, uh, you know, uh, with uh, points that you get while flying, for example. So we're creating a system where basically you can pay a full create a full transaction chain on blockchain for a similar program where you have vouchers and so on. And we're also launching a private market, uh, or we launched a private market called Nasdaq Private Market. Right. And the issue in the US is that when you register a new issuer uh, and the shares for that, there's no central database for that anywhere. So it's a very chaotic market. So our view is with the Link project, which is completely blockchain driven, is to be able to create a complete registrar and to manage the whole transaction from the issuance of the share or the equity of that private company, all the way for the possibility to that private entity to be able to transact in that company. And all that we can create on blockchain. And we're simulating this within our own ecosystem right now, but eventually we see that this can be a platform that can be a pub of public use. Got it. Vinay, I'd love to hear um, for your from you, you know, as, as head of commercial, head of the commercial growth fund, I mean, the overarching mission again is to um, find and establish, find and vet um, promising rapid growth companies and offer them um, advertising opportunities on television. Correct. So, um, what does the vetting process sort of look like on that front? Uh, it's, um, it's it's a lot like a VC. So we're we're focused on growth phase companies. So if you're if you're swallowing two million of investment, then we don't want to, and we we're a passive shareholder and we've invested in an online mattress company, we've invested in a jobs marketplace, we don't want to be controlling those companies. So we're looking for typically like 5% stake. That means the company has to support and we have to believe the valuation is at a certain level to support that, you know, one or two million going in. If you invest less on TV, less than a million, I don't think you really get the benefits of TV, which is, it's a sort of, it's a, it's a sort of, contradicting argument, I think. You need to spend more to get reach and brand impact <coughs> and trust. 
And so we look for bigger ticket sizes, which means a certain stage of maturity. Uh, and then we, we go out in the field or we receive uh, you know, more than we can swallow, really. We, we, you know, we're looking at, I've got a funnel of probably, I've probably met 300 companies this year. We've done 10 deals and we've deep dived on 25. Can you, can you, can you talk about one of those deals or one of those companies and kind of blow that up a little bit for all of us and talk about how you gave, extended these, worked with them and, ex and basically enabled these sort of advertising opportunities? Uh, okay, so I could talk about one, which is the, which is the first one we did on, on equity basis, about two million investment on a business, a, a Swedish business called Readly, which is, a, um, you'll relate to this because it's a Spotify for magazines, and I think there's a, you probably invested in one of these, right? So I'm Swedish, so I know. Oh uh, yes, okay. So, I mean, they're so you know they're digital natives, super skeptical on TV. They, um, they um denied about the deal, and so do we. In, Frankly, right. So we, um, anyway, we, we got the deal away. We've now got six months of data. Um, obviously, it's UK. They're, they're in three markets, but it's UK media inventory I'm giving. Um, it's turned out that they they've got a material inflection point in their growth rate of UK subs. Uh, I can't reveal the data because um, I haven't agreed with with them. So, so the and and the interesting thing we're finding is that. There's a measure of engagement that, so how frequently are people using the app, mm -hmm. uh, which they use to measure the quality of the cohort, that customer base. The TV cohorts are performing better than all the digital cohorts. And we're still not totally sure why this is happening. So I hope to update this environment or on, on why that is. I, I suspect, or, or here's a hypothesis I have, is, is do people absorb advertising in a different way when they're leaning back and watching a higher quality piece of content when the ads serve to them. Hmm. Can, can I, yeah, as, as, the, as the, the dumb American, what, um, what is the proposition? Do you give them $2 million in cash or $2 million worth of TV commercial time in exchange for this investment? So if you turned up with a suitcase of £2 million, I treat your cash like I would give you airtime worth that two million pounds, basically. So, so, so I don't. I only invest airtime. I'm investing off our balance sheet. Coming back to the innovate, how we look at innovation here. I think one of the challenges with innovation is that you, it always absorbs cash. We're not actually using our cash right, right, to right, make right, these right. investments. Right. Okay. And right. you get treated like a, you know. So I'd probably prefer the suitcase of cash, but. Hey. Um, Adrian, how large exactly is Just Eat? I mean, in, in terms of how many employees actually work there? So we, we, we employ about 1,500 people uh, globally. In revenue terms, uh, we're, we're saying we'll do 371 million pounds of revenue in, um, in 2016 for the full year. It's, you said 1,500 employees. Correct. And are they, where are they concentrated? Are they concentrated out in the UK? We've got, we've got most of them in the UK, but we have, we have pretty large teams in... Uh, Australia is our second biggest market. Um, we've got quite a few people in Canada. Uh, we, we have a joint venture going on in Brazil and Mexico. Uh, we have a technology team in Kiev. Uh, we have another, another one in Bristol. Um, we've got a couple of offices uh, in London. So we're, we're, we're quite dispersed uh, geographically. Yeah. So that being said, how do you drive innovation? And I hate to use the word innovation over and over and over again. <laughs> but uh, how do you drive innovation in a, a company that large, 1,500 people, yeah. uh, many of the companies obviously on the floor are much smaller, um, but also a company that is dispersed around the world. Yeah, so I think, I think you, you have to make that scale work to your advantage. And, and, and where um, being a big company is fundamentally different from being a startup is I think the culture and the DNA of the business become so much more important when, when you're operating at scale, simply because you can't keep track of what everybody's doing mm. all the time. You know, if, if the four of us, um, the, the five of us were, were running a business together, you know, I could sit there and know what all of you are doing and micromanage you and, and whatever. Um, I, maybe I'm not a great boss like that, but, but um, we, we would be very, very close to each other and you know, we could build a great culture quite easily together um, and get a lot done. But when you're people all over the world, you've got to have some cultural DNA that makes innovation flourish. And I think a, a key part of that is a culture where you don't punish failure um, and where you, you, um, you believe from the top down 
the, the best ideas often come from the, the, the front line of the organization, because it's, it's the people in, you know, I spend a lot of time sitting with our customer care teams, going out with our sales teams to speak to restaurants, and the best ideas often come from those people and, and, and from our, our restaurant owners themselves. Um, so j j just to give you an example of how we've, how we've um, fostered that, we've actually uh, used a data visualization tool called Tableau um, to put data into the hands of um, all of our employees. We have a license that enables everybody in the business to get access to, to the uh, data and visualize what's in our, our data warehouse through Tableau. And what that means in practice, it's amazing to see, is our salespeople, our territory managers out in the field in you know, Australia or Ireland or wherever, um, can pull their own reporting for restaurants and then go into a restaurant and, and say, look, here's something I, f I thought you would find very interesting. Maybe you should start delivering to this area. Um, do you realize that this menu item you've got hasn't sold for the last six months? Or the average price of a chicken tikka masala in your area is actually nine pounds, but you're only charging seven pounds. You could put the price up. There's a huge amount of information that we can bring into these restaurants using technology. So by, by putting the tools in the hands of the front line, all kinds of innovation has, has flourished, which would never have happened if I'd, if I'd sat in London and tried to, tried to think of this stuff. Uh, how do you, and this is for all of you, um, you mentioned failure, failure, Adrian, and I mean this in the most constructive sense. Um, for example, uh, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos has said repeatedly and quite publicly that one must uh, fail, perhaps even repeatedly, in order to ultimately succeed. Mm -hmm. And certainly, uh, Jeff is a good example of that. You know, he's, uh, Amazon is dominating, but you know, it has made some mistakes along the way. I'd love to hear from your perspective, from each of you, um, how you manage failure, what's an example of a failure, and what did you learn from it? So I, I can start. So we have a substantial number of failures and different kinds that we have behind us in our baggage, and we've tried to learn from every one in terms of making improvements around for the next venture. So we've done acquisitions throughout the years. We've probably done at least 30 acquisitions, and many of these have failed. I mean, integration and integrating innovation is not always as easy as one thinks it is. So building the culture of trying to integrate that innovation is, is just as important as trying to innovate yourself. Uh, and that's a key asset in terms of bringing the culture, how to integrate that. The other aspect is, to back to what I was saying before, the core has to be innovative in the sense that you have to be able to try new projects at a marginal cost uh, and an efficient way and have a product management uh, program in place to be able to support that kind of innovation. So we have something internally called GIFT, which is basically we allocate uh, X amount of million dollars each year mm -hmm. for employees to come up with new ideas. And then essentially we run almost like a VC program internally where people can present these ideas and if they pass the board, they actually get funded. And many of these ideas don't even make it out of the room in, in the sense that um, we, we give them some funding, they can test the waters, but they don't make it outside the building. But some of these ideas have become fantastic projects. Is there an example? Like yeah, so well, again, the commodity exchange that we launched was a gift idea where we basically decided that we have always been an exchange for equities, listing companies, trading, you know, traditional equity. And essentially, we decided that we wanted to go into the commodity space, and that was an idea that grew within the company, had to go within this gift program, it made it out of the gift program, and now is a fully flourished exchange, still aiming to compete, uh, and not the established venue, but it's definitely doing very well in terms of competition. So, so fostering that spirit is, is key within the, you're allowed to fail, but you have to learn from your mistakes and make sure you analyze that carefully. When you say very well, how, how well? Sorry, how, how? How well it's performing, how well it's doing? Well, you know, we measure a number of trades. We never measure participants. So, of course, we have a long way to go, but we have several hundred thousands of trades and we're launching different instrument types on a regular basis now. And it's called uh, NFX and it's, uh, you know, the National Futures Exchange. Uh, so, from, uh, so it's focusing on commodities uh, and we see, a, 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 you know, we're competing with the CMEs and the, and, and the big commodity exchanges, the established ones. And we hope that we will succeed, but it really is essentially a startup within an established business. Got it. Uh, Vinay or Stephen? You know, I would say my, my uh, 
most interesting experience with failure led to realizing the importance of speaking truth to power. Um, you were talking at Just Eats about your frontline people trying things. That frontline person may try something, it may or may not work, the impact on the overall company will be marginal. If it works, you learn from it, hopefully. Mm -hmm. If it fails, probably uh, doesn't affect your stock price. Uh, we had a case in our company where the CEO, based on all the data he was given about how the CPMs in video are holding and the CPMs for text were going down through the floor. Mm -hmm. So the, as CEOs do, there came the more video edict. And we relaunched one of our best known brands. Uh, it, 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 this has been talked about at Sports Illustrated. We, you were there probably when we did it. We relaunched Sports Illustrated and lost 30% of our traffic. Now, uh, luckily I was in a position to walk into the CEO's office and say, but you did, you have to understand, you did this. You said to the editor of Sports Illustrated, I need more video and I need it where everybody's going to see it and we can monetize it on the top of the page. Great, but people come to Sports Illustrated for scores. What's the score of the latest game? And we ended up burying the scores <laughs> while making him happy that we, gave, we created more video. And somebody had to say, no, you, you did this. And, and the learning from this one is how, um, you don't need to teach people how to do the same thing again tomorrow, but when you start changing the playbook, you, you have to learn how to communicate change or half the changes you make will create unintended problems. Uh, I take it That's then, a form of failure. Fair enough, uh, and I appreciate that. I take it then that uh, Sports Illustrated that's cor course corrected and scores are more prominently displaced? We, there was a rebuild. There had to be, a re you know, after our massive rebuild, there had to be another massive rebuild to figure out how to get back. You know, it's, it's one thing to have someone and lose them, and that takes a certain amount of whatever unit of energy you want to, uh, term you want to use. Imagine having them, losing them, and getting them back. That's four times as much energy as it talked to, as it cost you to lose them. So you try not to make those mistakes too often, but when you make them, it's a great deal of effort to get somebody back Fair. in the digital world, for sure, Fair. where there's so many different places they can get sports information. Uh, what about you, Vinay? Um, in, well, in the investment world, we're not really trying to shoot for failure, right? So I think, I think if we, so we, we know there will be some failure. I think the, if, if all the investments turn out to be home runs, then actually, you know, we'll probably look back and say, are we you know, investing too safe, right? So, um, so I expect some failure. And I think corporates are more accepting because of people like Jeff Bezos of, of this approach. So as long as you're managing that and you're not in a, in a sensible way, then I think it's I think corp it's a great way for companies to know that they are innovating because it, it tells you exactly how much risk they're taking. Of course, you don't want to be you know, failing everything, right? So. What constitutes success? And I mean that in the sense that you know, I'm based in San Francisco. I talk to venture capitalists on a daily basis. Um, and for them, the rule of thumb is, um, and I realize it's a different model slightly from you know, what you're doing. Uh, you know, for every 100 startups or investments, uh, two or three may ultimately may be huge uh, Ubers, another seven might you know, break even, and the rest are just kind of a wash. Um, so this, what, what constitutes success on your end? Well, but I think in that case, like the I US ecosystem, which is, apples and oranges, yeah, so sure. like, I think you're, it, it is apples and oranges, because you've got 300 million people in the most um, highest GDP country with most amount of technology enablement, you have different capital that can flow in to build consumer propositions. So when you see growth phase companies in the US ecosystem, they're raising one, 200 versus 25 here to launch a product because you're going for smaller addressable markets and you're generally focused on like UK, Germany, France, which are, you know, they're not launching pan-European. So the numbers are slightly uh, different. Uh, so the, you, the, in the case of the US, you've, you see that the, the investors of Twitter and Facebook are you know, funding hundreds in the ecosystem just on US-centric products and services 
which you know, doesn't really exist here. So you're seeing a different flow and risk appetite in the US than you're seeing in the UK ecosystem, or would you say UK European ecosystem. Um, I, I don't think quite, so it's, it's less polarized, I'd say. But I think also you, you don't have to define success purely in, in financial sure terms. I mean, we, we started a, um, uh, I think it's the only um, f specifically food tech incubator uh, around. And the main reason we did it, it wasn't because we thought, you know, we've got a high chance of finding the next Uber necessarily. It was more because we want to foster innovation um, in the sector. And, and we recognize that there'll be loads of great food tech ideas that other people have outside of the boundaries of, of our company. And we want to encourage that and, and help, help that whole ecosystem of, of, yeah. of, of founders to, to exist. And you know, maybe we'll make some money out of it, but we're actually more concerned about the innovation and, and helping it to, to flourish. Got it. Uh, I, I hate to nitpick it because I'm, you know, I'm a reporter. We love our numbers. We love our stats. Um, so I guess my next question is around the idea of innovation and cost. Uh, what does innovation sort of cost for all of you? Certainly, it's all well and good when we talk about, you know, at Google, for instance. Maybe they take 20% of their time each week to yeah. to focus on a side project, or you know, teams can sort of run wild and do this, this, or that. But it can come at um, at a cost, both time-wise, resources-wise. Um, so what? What does innovation cost to you? Yeah, but I think you can turn around and say there's an opportunity cost if you don't innovate. And that's <laughs> probably bigger than the actual cost of innovating itself. So, so I think innovating is, has to be in the DNA of the company. Everything from hiring the best talent. If you're not innovate, you know, have innovation in the core of the company, you will have difficulty hi hiring the best talent. Uh, and I think you know, we measure more from an opportunity cost if we don't continue to innovate because on the technology side, we will lose customers because we always have competition facing us with new, established, new or established players trying to define themselves in a better way. Uh, so we, we, you know, we invest on a regular basis in an R&D point of view, you know, less than $100 million a year in innovation in all different forms. Everything from the gift program to launching an entrepreneurial center in San Francisco to uh, launching hackathons for our employment programs to attract the best employees, to launch innovation labs to work with big data, uh, you know, where we invite startups to work with big data, to investing in AR, uh, AI companies or blockchain companies to make sure that we are in the forefront but not fully committed, trying to understand what is happening in different sectors. So all those things are costs, but they're investments, and if we don't do those investments, it's going to be a huge opportunity costs on our existing business in the long run. So it's very difficult to put a number on it, but clearly you have to have that as a part of your DNA. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So and it has to come from the leadership at the top and seep through the organization, particularly in big corporates. So well, I, I think what, what we're seeing as well is, is um, we, we, we used to think in this world of let's have an innovation budget and you know, it, it'll be separated from the core business. But what, what we're seeing is actually the innovation stuff in this climate of, of you know, rapid technological change, it feeds into the core business pretty quickly. I mean, we, we a great example is the, the Amazon Echo, um, which, you know, we, we saw that as a kind of innovative future kind of thing. But this is a hot product, um, and it works brilliantly. You know, do, just eat on the Amazon Echo. Um, I, I, I probably shouldn't say this, but my, my, my daughter, who's six years old, shouts, get me a pizza from Just Eat. <laughs> <It's interesting. laughs> um, and, and, and half an hour later, I, I get the bill in my, in my inbox, um, and, and I'm not even in the house. Um, so so uh, and, and as more of these devices ship, um, we, we uh, get more orders that way. So it's remarkable how quickly the, the innovative stuff bleeds into the core yeah. business and starts I think it's harder for public companies, too. I think it's harder when you're managing to quarters to see a, a payback which is both uncertain that it's coming and uncertain as to the amount and uncertain as to the timing. I mean, you've gone public somewhere after building this wonderful yeah. business. Have you found it a little more challenging to manage the dollars going out for innovation against uh, for your board or for your so stockholders when they're coming back? We actually back. honestly haven't. Um, oh. And I think, I think the reason is because we've been extremely clear with our board, with our investors, with analysts um, throughout our time as a public company and before um, that we are not running this business to get the biggest possible bottom line result today. 
um, we, are, we are investing for the long term in technology um, because we see that as, as the best route to a, to a, to a valuable company. So, so we, we, I think we've sort of carved ourselves out the right to do that. Um, and, but of course, the key thing is, are you delivering on your promises? And, and we, we've, we've yeah. delivered um, in every quarter that we've been a public company, we've, we've delivered to what we'd promised. Um, and I think that's earned us the right to, um, to make those kinds of decisions. What I saw as a, at a public company yeah. before Time Inc. was this company, similar uh, platform to Yahoo, let's say, without mentioning names, uh, it, it was a it was failing in mobile, completely failing in mobile. Um, but the CEO couldn't walk into a meeting and say, our mobile, is our mobile experiences are crap because he was afraid of being quoted and his stock <laughs> would go down that he had. A, and if you can't define the problem, then you can't work toward a solution. Answer, yeah. So I, I do find this is a rockier experience if you're in a public company than a private one. But I would argue that you know five of the largest companies today in the world are companies that fundamentally were innovative from scratch. Yeah. I mean, look at them, Apple, Facebook, and uh, you know, I think they've used the public platform in a very efficient way to innovate and to consolidate. And I think you know, we have a company in Sweden called Storytel listed with us, which is essentially an electronic platform to uh, you know uh, put stories onto a you know a tablet or whatever it is. Sure, sure. Uh, and they bought a publishing company just now uh, because they completely were sidetracked in terms of just staying on print, and, and they were the acquirer of the incumbent. So from that perspective, I think the public platform can actually help companies consolidate, give them visibility, funding, uh, granting funding. credibility uh, in terms of building that story. But they have to also not only depend on internal growth, but also have a, you know, uh, not only organic, but they have to have an acquisition strategy, yeah. grow that business. But at the end of the day, whether it's a VC, whether it's a public investor, you have to have an equity story. You have to convince your investors, whether they are in the public market or in the private market, that this is where you want to go, because I think even companies in the private world are struggling to convince their current investors that they want to invest to go there whilst they're making money here. Sure. So I think, it's, I think it's not necessarily a public issue, and there are many benefits. Of course, I'm an exchange, <laughs> uh, but <laughs> the, the benefit and of being a example, public... in your example, I'm the publishing company that got eaten. Well, you know, that's the issue. And I think you have to have a CEO that can afford to, to say, you know, be not, whether he's public or not, to, to really give the message of where he wants to be in exactly. the long run. But, but, but also, I think what, what, what you need to do is focus your, your engineers on innovation for the, for the short to medium term as well as the very long term. You know, because yeah. engineers love working on the, you know, 10-year moonshot. And of course, they should be. And, and in every company, there need to be some people doing that. Um, but you know, it, it, the, 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 just an example of sort of short to medium term innovation that can, I think, make a profound impact is we're using a, um, uh, we're innovating with bots to manage uh, customer service queries. Said bots, bots. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, so we've got um, we've got a, um, uh, a team working on using a bot um, to. So you know, on, on an average Saturday night in the UK, we'll do about well over 400,000 orders in the space of, of about five hours in the evening um, through our platform. So a small percentage of those 400,000 plus have something go wrong with them. And that generates you know, a huge amount of um, short-term uh, heat and, and query load. Well, if we can get bots to deal with the most standard queries, our, our growth um, is, is then much more efficient because we don't need to throw people at, at every consumer problem that, uh, that comes up because we can do it with the bots. So, so, so it's short-term innovation, the sort of things that engineers enjoy doing, but it can actually have a bottom line impact in the next you know, six to 12 months. Um, obviously our audience consists of many entrepreneurs, executives, and so forth, um, and you are all very experienced, obviously. What piece of advice would you give them? I would get listed. I would list my company. Uh, <laughs> you would list your company? Independent of what you're more doing. Exactly. Where, <laughs> <laughs> buy more magazines. <laughs> Eat curry. Yeah. Oh, 
<laughs> All right. No, no, I was just joking. I'll let someone else answer first. Well, f what's the context? So, what kind of advice? I mean, it's a very broad question, right? So, <laughs> so yeah. So, what in in the context of what? Growing your business? What? what, what? <laughs> So who, who am I addressing this answer to? I think maybe one, one, one uh, important <laughs> advice, be able to tell your story, tell your vision, you know, uh, whether you're a late stage company uh, okay. or an early so. stage company. If you are very innovative, you have to be able to convince your current investors or your customers that you know where you want to be, what the short, medium term roadmap is to get there. And, uh, and I think that's an important aspect. Well, you know, I, I, I've got one, one huge thing. I mean, I, I mentioned the, the DNA of the organization um, at the beginning, which I, I think is so important to, to build these things in the right way from the get-go. So our longest serving employee in the world um, is our CEO, um, uh, David Buttress, who, who isn't the founder, but he's, uh, he's our longest serving employee. If I think back to Google, uh, where I, I worked for um, six years, many of the, uh, not just Larry and Sergey, but many of the very early uh, employees at Google were around you know, 10 plus years later, running huge functions, managing thousands of people. You know, Susan Wojcicki, who's the CEO of YouTube now, was a super, super early um, employee at Google. So what, what, what Just Eat, I think, managed to do, and, and certainly what Google managed to do, is we found people in the very early days of the company when we were literally you know, uh, a handful of people who had the growth potential to still be there when, the, when it was a very big company and to sustain the DNA of the organization. So you know, if I was someone sitting here running a you know, two, three person business, I would really think about that. You know, be, be, be really conscious of every single person you bring on board needs to pass that kind of test. You're not just hiring them to do a job in the next three weeks, you're hiring them to potentially be there in, in five years' time, um, managing hundreds of people, and, and you've, you've, you've got to believe in everyone you bring on board so intensely. Seaman, it looked like you had a thought for a moment. Well, yeah, I think you've got to learn to sell. I, I think the gifts that it takes as a developer or engineer, in some ways that level of narrowness and focus uh, operates against the, the personality, where you are on the personality spectrum to sell well. Uh, and you've got to overcome that. Uh, I, I would say the, the, the great architect Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, when he set up the school, Taliesin, would insist that these architects who, you know, in those days were coming out of Bauhaus, very rigid ideas, had to bring a dinner suit to go to school at Taliesin and had to do musicals while they were studying at Taliesin. And his view was, if you can't develop the personality to sell the skills I'm giving you, then you shouldn't be here at school. And he was one of the first people who recognized, I think, I love that story, that he recognized that if you can't sell the town on building this 50-story building, what point is it, what's the point of my teaching you how to do it? So I think Developing your sales skills is important, and if you want to know if you have them, I'll give you a good test. Tomorrow, Yossi Vardy, the founder of this conference, will be here. He's flying in, I think, from China. If you can go up and explain your... He's going to kill me. If you're going to go up and explain your company to Yossi uh, long enough for him not to turn attention somewhere else, then you're a good salesperson. So he'll give you about 15 seconds and then move on unless it's interesting. So if you can make it with Yossi, you, uh, you've won. Um, the, I think the second point I would make is, of the three uh, tools you have to build your company, there's, there's build, buy, and partner. Um, VCs had tended to underrate the partnering function of the three. I think for a very long time the VCs felt you're going to build it, and if people don't just auto come, just show up uh, virally, quote unquote, then it's mm. the wrong product. Um, I think many great companies were left on the highway because they couldn't partner with people mm. like Channel 4 to market a great company so people know about it. So I, the, the second thing I would say is spend time thinking about who your strategic partners could possibly be, be clever about it and talk to them. Yeah. Oh, so 
I've now thought about and how to complement that. I think it's got to be great fucking product, right? So you've got to have, and that requires obsessive, passionate levels of detail, I think. And so you've got to have a great product, I think. So my advice is work on a great product. Do, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, we're, we've basically run out of time. My big thanks to, ev to Adam, to Stephen, to Vinay, and to Adrian for your time and your insight this afternoon. Thanks Thank again. You. Let's give them a big hand. <laughs> <laughs>